I, I'm a. I was gonna say I'm I'm a jazz musician first, so a lot of times my my instinct or my reaction to something first is better than if I have to think about it. <laughs> if I have, if I have so sometimes it's good. Um, welcome everybody, everyone to this uh, interview. Now we have Andrew K. Like you say, is a jazz <laughs> musician and also com a composer, and uh, he used music for healing. Certain kind of music he is going to speak about uh, later. Well, thanks, Claudia, so much for having me, um, and it's really nice to to have this this conversation with you. Um, I I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I grew up kind of in this general uh, like the, the GTA area, which is like the suburbs of uh, this city, the big, biggest city in, in Canada. Um, and I, you know, I could you could say I come from a musical family in the sense that my brother is also uh, a really wonderful musician. My uncle is an incredible musician. So there's definitely some music in my family. But I grew up, you know, taking piano and then I kind of found the saxophone. Um, and that really became my, my one of my passions uh, as, a, as a teenager was getting really into jazz and playing the saxophone and, and, uh, and playing music. Uh, and I was really lucky to be supported in doing that. You know, my parents really saw that I loved doing it and they, they encouraged me to, to pursue it. So I, uh, I ended up going to, um, to Humber College. Uh, which I kind of following in the footsteps of my brother who had already gone there a few years before me. I moved mm -hmm. in, we lived together, we became really, really close and uh, and studying, uh, you know, jazz music in, in the school. And so um, that was kind of where things started. But I, I really felt like I went, I looked at music um, as a, you know, as a way to find some sort of meaning for life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when it was jazz, it was really kind of, you know, maybe say prodding my intellectual side, okay, the complexity of music, the intricacies of all the different instruments and, uh, you know, compositions and things. Um, but as I was looking for influence, uh, you know, inspiration, I think I kind of broadened outside of just the, the jazz umbrella or the Western music umbrella. And I started to really fall in love with other world musics. Um, and one of them specifically is Indian classical music. And uh, I think it was as soon as I heard the, the Bansuri and uh, the Tabla, it was like there, it was just took me to another place that, that really opened up, um, you know, the possibilities in music for me. And so I, I started searching and ended up, um, you know, listening to a lot of Indian classical music, uh, being in an ensemble that was playing kind of some, you know, Indo jazz music arrangements uh, by one of my mentors, uh, Ravi Nampali at the time. And, um, and, and basically, my brother, myself, and a friend of ours, we decided to go to India. We said, we have to go there and explore and see what, you know, what what there is, what the music, the culture, what it's like. Um, and we took our first trip, and it was incredible. It really was, uh, you know, a pretty amazing experience. We not only got to, you know, experience India, at least the places that we saw, like in Calcutta, up in the mountains, the Himalayas, and in Delhi, that area, but we also met our our uh, guru, our mentor uh, in Indian classical music, um, Shantanu Bhattacharya, and that was the first time that we had met him. And I don't think we, you know, knew at that time that he'd become our guru in a sense. But um, it was just an amazing experience, and that, I think that planted a seed that really took, you know, over. It wasn't that I only became, you know, involved or consumed with Indian classical music. It was just that it was there was something really special in that music, in the practice of that music, in the um, searching within that music that that started to take a priority for me. Um, and so my brother and I, we ended up staying in India for a long time, almost 10 years, really dedicating ourselves to uh, to studying Indian classical music. Um, and and I think, again, even that music, even though there is a really deep spirituality built into the tradition of Indian classical music uh, I, I still was trying to find meaning and what what am I trying to do with my music what am I looking for in music um, and at a certain point when I was in India I remember hearing a quote from the Dalai Lama uh, who said someone asked a question of him saying like what do you think of musicians or artists in this world nowadays and and he made a comment and I'm paraphrasing but he made a comment kind of saying I mean, artists and musicians produce a lot of material and a lot of it is the expression of their suffering, which which might be good. 
but the world needs more healing. And so what I heard that as was like, wow, I really want to use my music to help people, to help heal, to create transformation. And so that kind of started me on my journey of the discovering, figuring out my way to use music um, as a healing modality, as a way to amplify um, healing practices, that kind of thing. And so that led me into sound healing. And so I kind of uh, keep those things at bay with each other is like how to create music, which might be an expression of my own experience, mm -hmm. but then also how to create music that can be used um, and how to use music and sound and vibration as a healing modality and try and, you know, so that's kind of the domain that I find myself in nowadays working, working within. Wow. Amazing. I didn't know that you have like almost the same path that your brother just like, uh, so basically you play together and you being in the same with the same guru in India and these kind of things. Wow, this is good. So for those that doesn't know, his brother is Jonathan Gay, and we make an interview of him <laughs> before, and we have some videos there in the channel if you want to go to to watch them. He spoke about ragas and these kind of things, and uh, but well, now Andrew, so can you please tell us for you? Um, for your experience, uh, what what is good uh, to play jazz for others? I mean, what do you think you give to others when you play uh, jazz, and why do you play it? Yes, it's like, um, what is your motivation? Like you say, you like healing, but this is not related with jazz. This is related with another kind of music. So, but you're still playing jazz, yes. So when you do these, um, how do you feel? I mean, how? And yeah, no, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, I think that any music can really be healing. I don't think there's only one type of music that can be healing. I think that it's music is such a personal thing that any type of music that can help us kind of unlock the you know, the the walls or the barriers that are in our heart, in our emotions, in our psyche, you know, everyone has their own personal relationship to different types of music. So it has a lot to do with the music we grew up with. Um, it has a lot to do with hearing music that we'd never imagined before. So I don't think there's any one particular type of music that can that that can heal on its own that's objectively healing per se. Um, but yeah, I do think that the intention behind the music when it's created for some purpose that makes a big effect. Um, and so I think, you know, jazz can be healing let's say in a way but that's not a lot of the times when i say i personally or what i think a lot of musicians are you know doing on stage when they're performing jazz music they're not up there saying i'm going to try and heal you with my jazz um but i do think for myself like when i play jazz it's more about finding that um that that ability to express myself truly or purely in the moment um jazz is really you know, it, it can be very complex. Um, and when you look at it in the, the realm of music, the way that the music works, um, the different people that are interacting with each other at the same moment that you're all improvising, you're relying on structures or melodies or forms of music that you all know, but it's brand new in that moment. And there's this beautiful ability to kind of interact as a, as a, small, um, uh, a small group and as an individual at the same time. And everybody hopefully is finding their way to be totally present and connected to that thing outside of themselves while staying connected inside. And for me, I think there's a magic in that. And, you know, I, I would see that when I saw live performances of music when I was young and it would just be this magical energy coming off the stage of how, how they're listening to each other deeply, how they're offering things to each other they're reacting and interacting so there's something magical about that that i think i really fell in love with and wanted to pursue and so that's what i feel like now when i'm performing and playing music that's more of a performance setting then it's it's really about that it might be playing solo and i'm trying to convey my expression of music my expression of myself through music in that moment and hopefully the audience will receive or pick pick up on that and maybe they might be inspired or maybe have an emotional response uh, uh something like that and as a group when i'm performing as a group then it's a lot about you know how do we work together what magic can we create in that moment for people who are listening um to, to kind of be taken to a different place of of hopefully contemplation or you know uh some sort of uh, uh 
uh, evocation of something inside. That is, sounds wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just just as um, I mean, like yeah, you say, one, um, like one of the some. the real sources of most Western music is in the blues, um, which definitely oh, comes from the the slave era and the music of of many of the um, Black Americans who were enslaved in that time, and, and from that you know, bringing the essence of maybe the African heritage that, you know, the musics that are from their peoples from before and the new expression of the suffering they were, you know, subjected to in the slave era, that definitely is the source of a lot of Western music um, in terms of a, like North American Western music from like blues to ragtime and jazz and, and so on. And so we can see that, that, that kind of tree funneling all the way down to the blues. So, yeah. Yeah, so then it's like uh, when this begins, they try to release this pain, no? This like uh, they try to release all this anger that they have accumulated in them. But now that you speak about the jazz, that is all improvisation and it's all like uh, I don't know when I'm going to enter, but I have to hear the others all the time. I have to to really be there in the present, because if I am in imagination, I will lost all the notes, yes? So it's a good exercise to be present, I, I will say, no? And to yeah. have attention. Yeah, it's amazing. So that is a good, um, I mean, it's a good uh, exercise of healing also for the mind. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How do we, how do we, how do we stay present? And, and it's like we can't we, we can't necessarily try to be present we can but maybe the trying we fail in that exactly so we, yes. we find ways the modalities that we learn that we understand that we resonate with to be able to say okay this act that i'm in is allowing me to stay present or i'm able to stay present while doing this and that, mm -hmm. that's where i think that if it's if it's aligned with what our purpose is what our calling is in our life then we can really find a lot of joy and beauty from that. And hopefully that's what we can, you know, share with others. Yeah. yeah something that I would like to ask you is how you don't identify with the music because I mean, create a kind of uh, attachment. I remember when I was playing an uh, uh, instrument uh, in my childhood and then ten years, I really didn't want to separate from my instrument. I was all the time there with my instrument and it was like, what's my beloved, you know? And nobody can touch it, you know, and it's like super like my precious, you know. And, and then I forget about everybody. <laughs> so I, I kind of begin to be super attached. I have to leave it. I, I could not do any more music because it was too much for like, I will be consumed by that. How do you not get consumed by the music? Yes, because it's like really jealous. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I, I I think I think growing up in Canada in North America to kind of you know British uh, you know pair like uh, British ancestry parents and stuff. Um, and I grew up uh, very. I feel very fortunate and privileged to be able to have grown up here and have like the things that I was offered as a as a kid. So I I feel like music was an outlet for me to discover myself. And so it, it I, de I never felt like overwhelmed by be getting lost in music. I felt good about getting lost in music. And that was what kept me busy um, in, like, so let's say, high school, where I would, I would be happily able to just sit and play music. Um, mm -hmm. And it didn't feel like I was being consumed by it, let's say. Um, and, and I do also think that it, I was coming from, I was coming at music from a place of, the mind, you know, the intellect, I'm trying to understand it at that age, mm -hmm. the way that I was, the way that I am, it was really mental. And it was like, just trying to understand. And so oh, yeah. it, it was, it was less of the, like, there was definitely emotional aspects to it, or there was things happening. But the, I think the predominant thing for me at that time was, was mental. It was like, let's, let's just figure out everything. <laughs> um, and I think for me, it was like more of a pathway to kind of start there and go go down you know like if i started up here then it was a matter of saying okay let me go down and figure out what's going on in in here with with how i feel about music and or um, in on the soul level like okay what's what's the meaning of things and spirituality and that's why i think i kept searching in music for that and that's 
eventually why I discovered Indian classical music. And, you know, from that sound healing, because I think that that took me from the place of just looking at music as like a, a practice and, a, and a, a way to express my intellect or the understanding of things to a way of really feeling more about life and then being able to like um, give more meaning to my life or what I was doing. And so it was a, for me, it was a, a kind of, that was the pro uh, progression of things. Um, and, and I think for everybody, it's different. Everyone has a different experience. Mm -hmm. you know, like you, like you express, like, that's beautiful that, that you, you have that, that kind of feeling of being like totally absorbed in the music. Um, everyone has their own pathway to find that in their life if that's what they're looking for you know I think everyone can have a relationship with music and not necessarily be a musician or you know there there is this kind of divide that there's like musicians or performers and then there's like listeners and I think like the more we engage in musical practice mm -hmm. the less those two things need to be so far away from each other yeah from each other yes okay thank you uh Andrew, yes, it's nice to that you say I uh, begin from the mental, yes. I never begin from the mental when I was here, when I was producing music, you know. <laughs> For me, it was like all about emotions. <laughs> so it's very different. Yeah. It's so funny. Um, so now, can you please um, explain me what the sounds means for to you? It's like the sound, the pure sound. Sound, yeah. Sound, yes. Um sound like i mean for me I, like i kind of group in sound and vibration um obviously sound is what you could say is like the the audible part of vibration everything is vibration there's lots of vibrations that we can't hear um and so can we call those sounds maybe maybe not but the stuff that we we can perceive with our with our listening Um, I would say as sounds and that involves everything. It could be a beautiful sound on an instrument. It could be someone's voice um, or it could be the sound of a truck going by or, you know, the interference of some sort of static or electromagnetic sound. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of times broadening our, our understanding or our uh, acceptance of what sound is, is a really beautiful first step of just kind of centering ourselves Um, one of the practices that I like to offer when I when I do workshops or work with kids is about listening and kind of the idea of we, you know, if we have the ability to hear, which most people do, unless, you know, you're deaf or you've lost your hearing, um, and then there's a different type, type of listening we can do. But if you can hear, then then you have the ability to listen. And a lot of times people kind of deal with those two. It's like, are you listening? <laughs> are you actually paying attention to what you're, you're hearing? Or are you just hearing things and it's going in one ear and out the other? And so this attention to being able to listen, uh, I think is the first step. Um, and we, you know, we practice that in relations all the time. Um, I was uh, exposed to the um, a concept or like some work that uh, Pauline Olivieros Uh, it was an amazing composer yeah. um, that she uh, wrote about. I found it when I was in college and uh, she wrote about this concept of deep listening, which was this idea of going beyond just the basic listening, paying attention to one sound. Oh, I hear the sound over there, but the ability to like be present and go deeper into your experience of really listening to everything around you. How much can you actually hear all around So if you take a moment just to sit and go inward and close your eyes, then you can start to try and pick up on all of these different sounds that are around you. And that might be, you know, you might be in the rainforest and you can hear beautiful animals and, you know, you might also hear <clears throat> other sounds that maybe are not so congruent to what you think that space might be like chainsaws in, in the rainforest, you know, or if you're just in your backyard, you might hear birds, but you also hear the sounds of the city, you know, and that the idea is, is that it really helps you to practice being present in the moment, but also being expansive to be able to hear and kind of stretch your listening further and further. So this idea of like the paradox of being able to push your hearing further away allows for what's happening inside to become even more and more centered and grounded. So, I mean, you speak it now mostly from, yeah, the function, that's the, like, how our body works and these kind of things so but do you think a sound is like connected with god you know because we always say god's light 
Yes. And when we are speak like light is very fast, you know, in physics, in physics, and la and the sound is very slow. Yeah. So, so actually we can say, mm, God is not in the sound or is also in the sound. But it's a slow, so it's a, it's a lower vibration that the light or the sound also have light. How do you, I mean, could you tell me something about this or did you ever think about this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the idea of God as light. Um, I think there's so many examples in, in you know, different religions or in world traditions that, that speak to the god or the the as a source of light this kind of light and darkness mm -hmm. uh, and i think in music the comparable or in sound and vibration the comparable thing is like vibration and silence let's say there could be one but i think there's a beauty in the difference of seeing it as a different spectrum but the same type of um uh, the same effect um i th i think i always related more so to sound as like a source of something than light, but I think it's all the same. I think if my understanding or for me, you know, God or the idea of a God um, as, as an omni, you know, potent thing might be like the universe. It's everything, you know, this whole existence, the whole creation is God. So inside of that is light and sound and everything that we experience. So when I use, or when I look to music or sound or vibration, as a uh, an interface, a way to understand or to experience the one or God, <clears throat> then I really think that, you know, there's the whole spectrum of chaos and silence, stillness, and sound is everything between those two points and going back and forth. Um, and, and for me, that's, that's how I can relate to uh, sound more and like you said about it being slower as a slower vibration than, than light what I like about that is that I actually think that it's more accessible mm -hmm. than light per se because especially in this day and age we're overwhelmed with light you know we're at, we're living in a world where we're creating insane amounts of light products <laughs> <laughs> like you know everything we're carrying around devices that have brighter and brighter lights in them that are shining more and more information faster and faster through fiber optic cables you know all these things like that it's all light and it's overwhelming and it's there's too much information and it's too fast and that's affecting our ability to to be congruent <laughs> with ourselves in the moment and i think sound actually offers an opportunity to kind of slow things down because you do have to be more still and more activated in the ears to be able to like pick up on things and and pick up on the different vibrations and what those vibrations carry um so i actually like the idea that it's kind of like looking at them not as one or the other is god or not it's like it's all god it's all everything but as a tool or a pathway to experience i, I love the idea of using sound and vibration as a way to like hey let's just slow down you know the the current trends that we have um because i think it can be really overwhelming when we're we're, mm -hmm. we're consuming ourselves with with kind of data of light yes and uh, i was thinking now that you speak uh, uh about the we are overwhelming with lights with a lot of things um yeah maybe one day we are going back to that source of light but now we are living in this physical body yes and this physical body is slow. <laughs> it's not so fast like the light and these kind of things. So for this reason, maybe the sound is like can be like a bridge between the that uh, God and the physical body. And in that way, I want to ask you, you know, uh, how do you heal with the sound and the vibration? You know, I mean, if you separate sound and vibration, or it's the same, no. And uh, do you need different kind of sounds like lower sounds like Whoa, or light like ah, like it's so, so what is the difference you know what they can produce? Sure. Um, I mean, similar to just referring back to light. I remember I met a, an artist who's a watercolorist in Saint Martin, 
And um, I'm not a, a painter or an artist, but I always liked art and I loved mm-hmm. trying to do that kind of stuff. Um, but I remember he explained the the different principles of the wavelengths of colors. So he was saying like red, that has like this, this, this frequency response where it sticks out. And that's why we have stop signs because it sticks out. Whereas yellow has this kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's not as prominent in that way. And blue just kind of fades away. So it was amazing to kind of understand the principles of color mm-hmm. from like that side of physics um, from an artist that was painting, you know, these beautiful landscapes of yes. the, you know, the Caribbean. Um, and I think that I was like, wow, that was, that was like really thought provoking uh, for me when he, when he expressed that. And I think similarly with sound, um, you know, certain sounds, high sounds versus low sounds, can it in some ways objectively trigger a similar response in people? So you can imagine like really high sounds, screeching or, you know, really high whistles. A lot of people have a, sim- a similar reaction to it of being like, oh my gosh, that's, mm-hmm. that's yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. whereas like very low sounds rumbling will evoke something different. So there is some ob- objectivity to that. Um, and I think, our human body has gotten very good at basically putting up with a lot of sound and vibration. We live in a world where we're surrounded, we're bombarded with sound and vibration. And so our nervous system has created all of these protections for ourselves to not become overwhelmed every day. Because if we actually tap into all the vibrations that are bombarding us, we would just be overwhelmed all the time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what I try to to work on in sound healing as like a first step is, is just creating a space where we have an opportunity to like slow down and start to be perceptive to our nervous system and those things that we've created, those safeguards and start to let go of those a bit so that we can let in the feeling or the effect of the vibrations that are already present, right? There may be already in the body that shows up as an attention somewhere. That's like an accumulation of vibration that we've received or we've been bombarded with and we've somehow, you know, placed it or it's somehow gotten stuck in a part in our body. So a lot of times it's about creating a space to allow that to be present so that it can like dissolve and heal itself. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, is common in sound healing because it's a fairly new thing and it can be associated kind of with, with more new agey type thing is that somehow like there, you know, sound has some magical healing effect. And I, and I, I, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it really has to do with the intention behind it. And so as a sound healer, I can play music for people, but if I don't put an intention behind that music, it's not going to be very effective or potent. And same thing in a sound healing session. If, if the person who is, is receiving the sound healing session doesn't set their own intention for healing, doesn't uh, imagine the effect or the, the place that they want to arrive at, it still might have some positive benefit, just the idea of being relaxed and taking care of yourself, but it's not going to have the transformational effect that, it could have if, if a really strong intention, a really strong visualization um, it, it takes place, then there's a real amplification of that um, intention with the sound. So I really look at it as being like, you know, sound healing is a way of using sound and music to amplify self healing practices. So we use sound to help a practice and uh, going deeper into an emotional feeling that's placed somewhere in the body, you know, unraveling some mental formation that we have um, by using sound to help us to, you know, to, to step away from that, look at it from a different perspective, experience it in a different way. And when we do all these different things, then some sort of change or transformation is possible. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Can uh, many questions there, but, because you say the person have to have an intention of healing, yes? So, for example, um, if uh, I want to take a chiller and that they have a clue what is the intention of healing, so then it's not going to work very well for the child. It, like, yes? I, I understand what you're asking. You Every person has their own capacity to understand 
um, you know, the complexity of what healing may or may not be. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think you're right with children. It's different in the sense that they're a lot more innocent and pure. They're not necessarily, uh, you know, they're much more present and in the moment. And so the intention for healing doesn't have to be an elaborate thing where they have to understand um, that I, Oh, there's this and this and this, and I have to go there. And, you know, it can be as simple as like, you know, what's 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 your favorite stuffed animal can you imagine hugging your stuffed animal it's more evoking a feeling of being in a place of um of stability or resonance or joy or peace it's more like saying like can we can we try to evoke that feeling and then as that feeling is evoked that can help to kind of counteract on maybe whatever you know things might be happening you understand the, the, the difference yes. there it doesn't have to be an elaborate thing and intention just has to be like a visualization of like this is where i would like it to to be okay so then it also can can be good with animal with animals like you can use yeah. just technique with animals yes or yeah actually yes. um with the the guy that i studied with uh john bullio who he's a uh, the person who, who uh kind of he didn't invent the tuning fork, but he really developed the the use of tuning forks um, for sound healing and for sound using uh, sound healing, like tuning forks with on the body and around the body. Um, and he was working um, in like Bellevue Hospital in New York with patients and, you know, using tuning forks after he discovered the power and the effect of the tuning fork on his nervous system and on himself. Um, and I think he, he was telling me about how he was working with a doctor, uh, a vet who was using um, the tuning forks on animals to help animals in recovery or that were, you know, in, in, in not a great shape. And he was, you know, as a vet helping them. And so he was using the tuning forks, but because the, their hearing frequency range is different, the, um, the, the tuning forks that you just play on the ear were not very effective with the animals in the same way that they are with humans. Um, okay. and, and so it was just because it's a different spectrum and, and obviously the animal's not going to sit there and, you know, listen and breathe <laughs> with the tuning <laughs> fork. So he was using the, the, these other tuning forks that you can put on the body that the vibration goes into the body, into the bone, into muscle, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he really wanted to have this, you know, perfect fifth interval, which is a really, you know, kind of core tenant of intervals and, and, uh, a strong, Um, relationship ratio of vibration that is very effective in healing and and so he developed like one of these extra you know tuning forks so that he could have these two to work on animals Um, and you see that it's one of these things like the application of sound healing I think is really limitless because you can apply it to so many different modalities so many different practices so many things you know if we look back in history humans have been using sound for healing you know, in healing practices for thousands and thousands of years. So we're just discovering new ways f- for us in this moment to discover new ways of healing for ourselves. And I think that that's a good example of like, it can, it can extend beyond our own individual hum- human humanity or human to, to like, you know, like younger and older people, but also to animals and to plants. Yeah. Speaking of the healing and all these, because uh, I really like that. Uh... <laughs> Um, I have a concern because, uh, well, here in Western uh, medicine, people usually reject everything that is coming from this kind of therapies. Yes, yeah? like it's like, oh, you are going to heal with music. Yes, you don't have to take your pills anymore. Or yes. So, because they say, I mean, you you are living in a physical body. I mean, how you think that you are going to cure with music? You know, if you're physical, it's like you say, if your mama or if your body is like, uh, it's necessary that you take a medicine. Yes. So, how do you will answer to this? I mean, it's it's true. You 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 still needed to take the medicine. But the music is going to help you to in, to solve something else, or I, I just can you clarify a little bit there? Yeah, sure. I I think you're right. In Western 
Western medicine or Western care, a lot of it has to do with relieving symptoms rather than finding the root issue. Okay. Um, and so that's created a system where it's like, well, for every little individual thing that can be isolated, then there's some individual isolated chemical or <laughs> pharmaceutical or something that will take care of that when actually that thing is a part of a whole system. Um, and, and just that in itself should break down that mindset of, oh, this is going to be the solution. That's not negating that absolutely we are physical beings and we have, uh, you know, maladies that definitely need Western medicine that can definitely help. So if you need a treatment, um, you know, that, that, you know, sound healing is not going to help in that setting. It's going to help with that, you know, and that's where I think it's more about um, broadening the understanding of a holistic health where, mm -hmm. you know, if you're dealing with uh, a mild an anxiety, which I think everyone <laughs> is because of this world, but like something like listening to music is, is in itself can be healing. And that's just listening to any music that you just love to listen to. And that can itself give you a space to just be less anxious, right? But if you actually put more intention behind that, and you listen to very, you know, specific music that you've found to be very calming, and you're, you know, that you're trying to help yourself with the anxiety, then that's even more healing. And if you work with someone individually, and you work, you know, week by week towards some sort of outcome, that's even more healing, right? But then if you keep going and say, maybe, you know, the, the, the illness is much, much deeply rooted, or it's much more um, serious in the sense of like, uh, you maybe a cancer, or mm -hmm. some sort of other kind of uh, chronic illness or uh, autoimmune or something like these things need more than just that. But that doesn't mean that the those practices are not also going to help. And I think there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that's starting to come out. Because as like you said, as more and more of the um, sound healing or more alternative, you know, holistic uh, wellness practices have become popularized. Um, a lot of people, like you said, just reject it and say, no way, I'm just going to trust in the system that we've had. And a lot of other people go, oh my gosh, that's everything. And they forget the other when actually it's about trying to find a balanced integration of all of them. And so there's a lot of research that has been done recently around the effects of sound where studies will show okay let's take two different people and we'll put them through the exact same healing you know like let's say allopathic or like medicine treatment but will one person will include breathing practices and will include meditation and will include sound healing and will include a lot of these other wellness things and the outcomes are just so much more effective because it's more holistic and it's taking care of more other elements of the being. And I think that's really the approach is not to negate one and accept the other, but to find the, the like, how do we understand the complexity of all these different interacting levels of being and make sure that we're taking care of all of those, you know, in a way that, that is uh, balanced or respectful to the different parts. Very good. Um, do you ever try? <laughs> do you ever try to heal um, breaking breaking a hand or a cut with the sound, a cut in the skin? Do Do you ever or oh, oh, hear that someone heal with this? Like because there are like I don't know. Uh, I mean, there are slow to heal, you know, you know, and you have to be always very patient. And but I don't know if the sound really helps or not. Yeah. So I, I the like, there's lots of different layers of that question. I would say, like, if we think about, I remember when I was a kid, I got a cut or a scrape, and the idea was is like make it scab and then the scab will fall off and then it'll be fine. And then it was like, later you're like, well, if you want a scar, that's a good approach. But if you don't <laughs> want a scar, then you should keep it moist and it will take longer to heal, but at least it will heal better right without a scar. And it's kind of like, a, Oh, that's a different approach. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to using sound, it's similar where it's like, yeah, there's not going to be some magical sound where I'm going to, you know, blow or whistle some sound into a cut and it's going to magically heal. Yeah. <laughs> um, But I think that 
taking care of a wound, something where like you can use um, like say a tuning fork or a singing bowl or some vibrational therapy around that can aid in keeping those cells kind of activated. Um, one of the scientific studies behind the, the tuning forks on the body is that um, in, in our body, we have nitric oxide. And that's one of the main precursors to healing is that it's a natural thing that our body makes happen. And it's always kind of cycling. Um, and when we have an injury that has to be cycling and that's what helps healing come. And so when you play a tuning fork on an area, it helps to spike that nitric oxide cycle. And so it brings the effect of healing in a faster way. So that's like a direct vibrational, you know, response that it helps uh, a natural process in the body happen faster, right? And there's also tuning forks that you can use on outside on the outside of your skin to help with skin cells, you know? So we, we can understand that vibration anywhere on the body is going to have a response from our body, right? It's something the mm -hmm. cells will be responding. They'll be absorbing that vibration and somehow responding, reacting to it. And so if we can choose the right ones, I imagine with like a cut, you could definitely help. You still need to take care of the wound. You need to get stitches or you need to have a bandage or you need to clean it. And maybe there's some, some beautiful medicinal ointments from plants that you could use, or maybe there's some, you know, chemical or pharmaceutical that you would like to use. It doesn't, you know, it's, everyone has a choice of what they would want to use. Um, but then I think you could add to that and help the healing of that by using vibration in different ways. So it's not that that's going to replace anything else, but it's going to help in the healing process. Beautiful. I like it a lot. Uh, I like how you explain it. So then you based your healing in certain methods. Yes, you learned it from someone specific. Did you follow any any method or any? Yeah, I mean, so I think for for the longest time, like when I was more moving from like understanding how I perform music to offering sound baths and sound baths are for a group of people, um, not an individual, then it was really about understanding how to hold space for a lot of people. Um, and I, I think I really just developed and discovered that on my own through offering sound baths. I didn't ever studied how to give a sound bath or I didn't study with anyone. But as, as I started to do more and more sound baths and use more sound healing instruments or my own instruments in a, in a, in a sound healing context, I started to start to like try to research and discover more modalities, more ways. Um, and that's where I did. I studied with John Bouillot, who the tuning fork, um, uh, guy who developed the tuning forks. Um, and uh, I've studied, like I've done a, a couple courses um, that have helped kind of understand some different systems. Um, and, uh, but I think in general, a lot of what I've done is develop my own understanding of myself through my own application of self healing practices. Um, and, and then learning how to use those, um, with people. So it's a, it, it wasn't like I went to school in one place and said, someone just showed me, this is how you do it. It was really a self-discovery process of my own methodology, my own way, but obviously drawing from others, expertise, others, experiences, um, mm -hmm. that they passed on to me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, my application or that's how I discovered my own, my own way of, uh, my own modalities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, um, now let's pass to more to how is a day of therapy with you, you know, uh, if you can describe uh, to us, so you can show us a little bit this technique. Yeah, sure. Um, so if, um, I think the easiest and most accessible way of like you could imagine as being almost like a self care practice is, uh, uh, would be me offering like a sound bath to a group of people. Um, like I just kind of described, whereas again, it's, it can't be really, really specific for me working with an individual. I'm more holding space and offering a context, a container for, um, uh, for people to, to do their own kind of process, their own experience. Right. Um, whereas when it's one-on-one -on -one and it's like, let's work on something very specific, then what that looks like is more, um, like a kind of, 
uh, relationship where we will kind of scan, we'll do an assessment um, of all the different layers of the being. So maybe physical issues, um, uh, emotional issues, mental things, uh, spiritual, you know, and we'll kind of scan, do an assessment over um, the entire uh, person and have a discussion around that. And then we kind of pick some healing outcomes. We'll pick some things we want to focus on in the sessions. Um, and that kind of sets up the, the trajectory or the context, like, okay, this is what we're going to be working on. Um, and then what a session looks like a one-on-one -on -one session typically looks like is like, it's a one hour, you know, one hour, one, one and a half hour, depending, um, where you, you know, you basically can arrive, settle in, we can discuss anything that's current mm -hmm. that's coming up. And then it's, a, it's about getting into this place where we can relax we have to kind of find that relaxation place we set the healing intention we move um uh you know we move into working with sound and then it's really about following the what comes up in that process and responding to it with sound and vibration different practices using different instruments different um using the drum using the singing bowl um, a lot of times I'll also use my uh, instruments like saxophone or clarinet or flute um, to offer and to, to share and play uh, and, and to create that, that um, transformational um, possibility in the mm -hmm. sessions. Um, and basically we'll do that over a course of, you know, let's say four or eight sessions. And that's where we see, um, you know, the real uh, effects happening. You know, one session can be very, impactful you can come for one session and it can be very much like wow that was quite quite an experience you know like i've never experienced anything like that before um but in order to really um activate that change that maybe we're hoping or looking for then it has to do with more like consistency and that's something too that i'll offer is uh suggestions on practices that you can do on your own so you know the session is very important but then here's something that you can take and you can try and do this every day and that can help you to work and continue the work that we're doing together on your own, because that's where you'll see even more uh, transformational effects. Lay down in the floor, or they are standing, or like, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, they dance with the music or not. I mean, um, I really, sometimes I see some pictures about these kind of things. I never went in something. Uh, but I'm not sure if everybody works in the same way. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, it definitely um, it, it is very accessible because it, you don't need to be in any one position, let's say. So if you're not able to lay down, um, then it doesn't mean you can't do sound healing sessions, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also very um, it's it's more about comfort. So. I mean, I guess if you really feel comfortable naked, then you could be naked, but I, that's not necessary. Most people wear just like kind of comfortable light clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think in most cases, what our body needs first is that chance to relax and that chance for us to go into a kind of an altered state. And then a lot of the processes that need to happen, happen on their own. And so it really looks very much like you're almost like laying and like relaxing or sleeping on a table. So mm -hmm. I, I use like a, a massage table. I also do it on the floor, depending. Um, I have a space here in Toronto that I work where I have all my instruments, but I also can take a, a good amount of instruments with me and visit people. So I can also go to someone's house and do it in the comfort of their home. Um, so it's it's very um, adaptable in that way. It doesn't need to look in any one particular way. And like you said, even the idea of maybe someone maybe moving or dancing, that's that's definitely happened and it's a possibility. Um, uh, I think we have to listen and we have to trust ourselves to listen to what is going on. And a lot of times what needs to happen is just this letting go. And then it's it, it's like stillness. But sometimes in reaction to that, there might be this need to move something. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, it's like we're, we have to be alive and we have to be reactive as well. Um, you know, we're not just passive people in, in, in essence. We have to have passivity and activity. And so we have to be really tuned in to know, okay. And that's something that we work on in a session is like, 
you know, maybe the first time it's quite passive because you just want to absorb and understand what's coming up. But then as we get comfortable and we start to address specific issues, then it can be more like, let's really go into that and let's see what comes up. Can we, can we push up against it? Can we try to try to shift something? By what? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, can you do this by Zoom? Oh, like online on Zoom? Online. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can. Um, definitely during the pandemic, that was something that a lot of people in the field shifted into um, was being able to offer what they were already offering like in person and being able to do it um, through, you know, uh, the, over the internet or, you know, in different ways. Mm -hmm. I personally didn't do that very much just because I feel like for me in the sound healing world capacity of my life, I really, really love the, the real vibrations. Um, you know, even though you can hear my voice right now and whoever's listening can hear my voice, it's coming through a microphone. And even if it's a good microphone, it's still not the same as if I was talking to you in person. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely like a disembodiment that happens um, in that process. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't, it can't work. It doesn't have an effect, but I, I really focused on being like, I want, I want to offer my sound healing in person. So that's where I focus, but for sure it's possible. And, and, you know, with decent equipment, um, with recordings, with, you know, we can, um, we can evoke the same type of sound healing practices through uh, a session on zoom. So it is possible. I it's not, it's just not an area that I wanted to focus my energies in, but yeah. So you don't have any, then, I mean, you don't have any recorder or any CD, any album that is related with uh, music that heals. Yeah, so no, you're right. Like um, what I'm working on right now this year, I have a, a couple projects where I want to create music that is more uh, purposeful for that. Again, mm -hmm. I find it hard the divide between like the music I do have available is all more creative, expressive music. I think has is deeply coming from a place of you know, my own spirituality or expression, but you're right. It's not with the intention to heal. That being said, I, I can put the intention into a piece of music that I record, but if that isn't activated in the moment that the person's listening to it, then it's, then it's just music again. You know, it's just something that someone can hear. And that's where I think like sometimes some of the music that I've heard that is like healing, you see on YouTube, there's a million yes, channels <laughs> giving, you know, 10 hours of this thing. And you're like, mm -hmm. well, It, it is very ambient, nice, soothing kind of music, but you can easily just put it on and ignore it. So if you're not going to activate an intention to use oh, okay. that track, it is, you know what I mean? So what I, what I want to focus on is, is being able to offer people um, something that's more personal or more, in, you know, uh, connected or tied to an experience. Um, so, you know, in a sound healing session, I will record the session And then you, you you can actually hear and come back to it. You can listen to the session that you just experienced in body and come back to that and practice. Maybe it's just a segment. Maybe it's just one thing that you can come back to. But the idea that you can, you can have that touchstone to an actual physical experience that you had, I think is really important. Um, and the other thing that I'm working on is, um, is using new technology like spatial audio where I can create experiences um, that will hopefully evoke a deeper state of, um, uh, of, of kind of like, let's say contemplation or expansion. Um, you know, with, with spatial audio, we have the ability to move sounds around, right? And that's similar to when I'm say using tuning forks around your head. So this feeling is moving around. So when you combine that, maybe say like that recording of that music, with the intention of, okay, this is what this is working on, then I think there's a good possibility. So that's something that I'm working on right now, but I don't have any um, of those tracks available yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have any advice uh, for people about uh, music and education? With music, yeah, it's, I think, um, you know, when you speak to almost anybody, I'm sure almost anybody can pinpoint or relate some music or some musical experience that they had to something in their life. It might be from when they were a child. It could be something that they, you know, a really powerful moment in their relationship. You know, everyone has a connection to music. And so it's, it's really about inquiring 
for yourself, what is it about that thing that allowed for that to be crystallized in, in my being? And if you can understand that even in the slightest, then you can hopefully have a relationship with music that will continue to offer you those moments. Um, and if that means just having your favorite music that you love listening to over and over and over again, awesome. If it's evoking that that feeling, that deep relating to it, that's mm-hmm. great. It doesn't need to be, I listen to a million things. If it's more about exploring new things and finding new musics, well, then you want to find that hunger in yourself to explore and find new things, you know? Um, so, and if that means wanting to learn an instrument, amazing. I think learning an instrument not to become a musician or a performer, but learning an instrument to activate your mind, to activate your, your heart, um, your instincts. If you can, you know, just as a, as a hobby, music is one of the most powerful things just to help, you know, balance our being because it it really requires us to, to organize and be analytical and be technical but it also encourages us to be creative and intuitive. And when we find a balance of those two, then we can really, I think, find um, a lot of inner peace and a lot of inner guidance to navigate this world. And so I think that doesn't mean you have to be a musician at all. It just means that you have a relationship with music and that could be picking up the ukulele, you know, every day. It could be just sitting in the morning and singing whatever comes to your head or humming. Um, but I think it the more that we can make that conscious and the more that we can uh, understand the, the sacredness of our own musical practice, the more, you know, the more powerful that it can be. Right. Right. I am agree with you (laughs) in everything. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you are a very soft person and I said, it's a good to speak with you. Also, Jonathan, I think they both have a very training emotional center and, uh, Yes, you, you 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 feel more mental, more mental, like you say, a uh, person that uh, have to intellectualize things before, and uh, is is great. So uh, now I just have personal questions, like uh, writers that inspired your path or musicians and. This kind of things, I don't know if you want to answer it or you want to jump to the practice part where our followers can, I mean, have a taste of what do you do? Sure, yeah. I mean, like easily in music, the you know, like I said, discovering new music was a big thing for me. So there's a million musicians that have inspired me. Uh, one of the biggest is John Coltrane. His music, his legacy, kind of like his path was huge, but also in the jazz world, like Miles Davis, um, you know, a lot of different saxophone players. Um, music that broadened my my mind from, or my my experience was obviously like Ravi Shankar, Hari Prasad, Shoresia, uh, flute player, like, you know, great musicians from Indian classical music. Um, and and then also just exploring the world of music, you know, finding uh, like uh, uh, a gamelan, um, listening to didgeridoo, uh, you know, from Australia or, or um, different music recordings um, from South America or uh, or Africa, you know, so like just really broadening me. So the, a lot of those are influences in terms of music. Mm-hmm. Um uh, when it comes to like writing or, or like writers or books, um, I think most of what I've read recently in my life has been more, um, let's say spiritual. So Sri Aurobindo and the mother um, was obviously a big part of, of being in India with my guru and like him growing up in the ashram there. So there's a lot of, of that that I kind of come back to as a spiritual guidance. But I also feel really um, connected to Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, um, and and also Zen. So like kind of a triangulation of those those different paths and spiritualities. So um, you know that's mostly more of what I've I think I've read um, in more you know in more recent past. Um, so yeah, I mean that that's more of my influences in that way. I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
you want to describe or your work in five words, if it's possible? Just describe all my work in five words, yeah? Yes. Okay, five words. Maybe, maybe um, in, inspire uh, healing with, well, I guess that's six. Okay. <laughs> inspire, inspire healing uh, with sound and music. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Beautiful conversation. Thank you.